We have a lot to be grateful for, a lot to be thankful for in regards to what God has promised us. And one of the great promises that really blesses my soul is that he would never, ever leave me, nor forsake me. Even in those times of darkness and uncertainty, he is there. Whether I understand what I'm going through or what I have to go through. He is there, my brother, my sisters. He is right there by your side, and he will never depart. Praise the Lord, somebody. What an assurance that we have. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how God has blessed each and every one of us with his divine favor. We've been dealing for the past several weeks in regards to the favor of God. We realize that the favor does not separate us from situations. It does not separate us from life and from tragedies. But nevertheless, God has made provisions for us because he favors us. What a blessing. Paul's letter to Titus, first of all, Titus was a Greek, an uncircumcised Greek. He was not a proselyte, but he was a Gentile. And he had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's plan of salvation, and he worked right alongside of Peter, of, of Paul. And he was a young minister, and he was given a responsibility to help establish the work in Crete by raising up elders to oversee the work. And I'm going to read from chapter 3, several verses, and my text is found in verses 3 to 7. It begins by saying, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility toward all men. Well, we know that our work could use some of that. Hello. Our world is desperate in regards to that kind of character that is to be present within us. Verse 3 says, at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envied, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, Something happened. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. I could sit down right now. The Bible preaches on its own. Let's take a look at verse 3. Paul is reminding Titus of life 
before Christ entered into the equation of our new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So he's reminding us of where we've come from and what state of mind and what state of relationship we had with God prior to Jesus being in our lives. An open invitation, asking the Lord, inviting him into our lives. Our lives were ruled by our independence from the word of God and being led by the Spirit of God. Now our lives are being dependent upon the Word of God and being led by the Spirit of God. What a contrast. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, there is an identification. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I'm talking to you daughters out there too, praise God. But that's the mark of a believer, is that we are no longer driven by our passions, led by our own thoughts, but we are led by the Holy Spirit that God so generously has given us who believe. That we wouldn't have to lean to our own understanding. That we wouldn't have to rationalize life's circumstances. But that we would know that he is working everything according to his purpose because we've responded to his love. And we can say that all things work together for the good of them that love God, the called according to his purpose. And truly, we, have call, we are called according to the purpose of God. We have been called to be a reflection of who he is in the earth. Paul is giving Titus some specifics in regards to how we as believers are to conduct our lives. We, when we were Driven by our passions, we were governed by the will of our sinful flesh. Whatever we thought, we responded to. We did without regards to consequences. We felt it, we did it. We didn't think about how that action has a ripple effect on our lives and in the lives of others. We were by nature the children of disobedience, according to Ephesians 2 and 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You see... We could not help ourselves as sinners because we were driven by human nature and human emotions. But now that we have the Lord in our hearts, we're driven by another passion. We're driven by compassion. We're driven by love, by grace, by mercy, by forgiveness, by all of the gifts that came so generously when the Lord poured out his spirit in our lives. Oh, glory to God. As children of disobedience, we made allowances for our malice and envy and being hated and hating one another. Yes, we still make excuses for ourselves when we are not walking in the Spirit of God. We're prone to lean to what we are familiar with. We're familiar with our fleshly desires. 
So we lean to that. If somebody does something to us, that leaning may be, well, I will get them. I'll do this because they did that. But you see, you don't win that way. You don't win. But when you love them with the same love that you've been loved with, and that is the love of God, you win. You confuse them. You see, because they're already anticipating you to act out in your flesh. Because all they see is flesh and blood. They see you as being human. But you see, when the Spirit of God comes in our lives, you know what? We become superhuman. Hallelujah. Spirit-filled. Led by the Spirit of God, not driven by our passions, and not slaves to sin. Verse 4, God did not leave us without an opportunity to change our state of being by the prince of the air. Who is the prince of the air? Lucifer. He is called the prince of the air rather than a king because there is only one king. And that's Jesus. Well, there may be earthly kings, but Jesus is what? King of kings, Lord of lords, to the glory of God. This prince of the air possesses power to manifest evil in the world through influencing people and commanding demons. You see, some people don't want to believe that there is a spiritual realm in our world, that there are demonic forces at work in the lives of the children of disobedience. You see, they are, they are in the control of the prince of the air. They're not in the control of the Spirit of God. They're not being led by the Spirit of God. They're not giving themselves to the Word of God. He possesses power to manifest evil. He influences the sons of disobedience, and we can refer to that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, are those who have not trusted Christ as their Savior, the children of disobedience. They have not trusted Christ as their Savior. Listen, you have to really, really work hard to go to hell. Because the Word of God has made it so easy for us to not go. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So you really have to work hard at going to hell. The way of a transgressor is hard. But if we have faith, faith in God, faith in his word, faith in his son's death and burial and resurrection and faith that he is now sitting on the right hand of God, making intercessions for us. I'm so glad that somebody is praying for me. I'm so glad that somebody is praying for me that is not of this world. I am so glad that somebody is praying for me that is not you. But someone is praying for me that is the Alpha and the Omega. 
that sees the beginning of my life and sees the end of my life and desires to direct the course of my life. I'm having a good hallelujah, praise the Lord moment here. Some of you have never had that. Stick around. In spite of our rebellious nature and attitude toward the statues of God, he continues to lavish his love upon us. He showed us favor by continually loving us, sending the only sin offering for the condition of our lives. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. Favor. Hallelujah. God didn't have to do that. He doesn't have to love. He's not obligated to loving you. But he does. See, we do things to entice people to love us. God does things because he is love. Verse 5, Jesus came into the world with the one purpose of saving everyone who bears the image and likeness of the Father. That's you, brother. That's you, sister. All the good things you will ever do can never, ever afford you the cost of salvation. Never. If we collected all of the resources here and all of our money together, it still would not be enough to purchase one single soul. It wouldn't. That's why Christ came, to be the offering for our sins, to be that once offering that paid the price. We will never be good enough to go to heaven. Hello. Well, you know, uh, my family, all we knew was church. I was a deacon in the church. I was a teacher in the church. I was a musician in the church. God is not concerned about your church experience. He is concerned about relationship. You see, we can be a part of church apart from relationship. Now, my father's name is George Hayden because my mother told me, and I have a picture of him, but there was no relationship. I'm a Hayden. I'm a Hayden. I am a Hayden. He is my father. I am his son. But there is no relationship. There was none. John 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I have prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and then I will say, Depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. So we can be identified but not have a relationship. Are you getting the picture here? I'm identified as being a Hayden. My father was George. I never had a relationship with him. 
So I did not know him, and he did not know me. God wants relationship with you. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know when he speaks to your heart that you're not having a bean and gas revelation. But you know that he is speaking to you because you know his voice. You've trained your spirit to know his voice. You've trained your heart to know his voice. Being in the church does not give us passage to heaven. It's being the church that gives us passage. I'm going to wrap this up real quick. Verse 6 and 7, God did not only save us from the penalty of our sins, which is death, but he washed us with the blood of Jesus and sealed us with his own spirit. Some of us don't want our children to have our spirit when we were in the world. Hello, somebody. We don't want them to act out the way we acted out. Mm. Because we didn't like it. We came to the knowledge of truth, and we realized that we were sinners. And because of what Jesus did and sealed us with his own spirit, if that is in favor, I don't know what is. He gives us pardon by grace, unmerited favor, therefore justifying having faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus unto salvation. The gift of mercy escorts us into relationship with God through the work of Jesus and his spirit favor. We then are recipients in sharing the kingdom of heaven and everything that goes with it. That's favor. God's favor is given not because of what we have done, but who we have become. We have become the sons of God, representing the kingdom of God, reflecting the ministry and work of Jesus Christ in the earth. God gives us favor because we believe and receive his Holy Spirit as a guarantee. I am so glad for God's gift of salvation.